The Expeditions of Willis Partridge by Harvey Weiss Willis Partridge jumped out of bed and looked out his window at a bright June morning. The sun bounced among the leaves of the chestnut tree that grew in the yard outside. A squirrel skipped along a branch of the tree, and a soft, warm breeze made the curtains on the window flap and billow. Willis, time for school. It was Willis' mother calling from downstairs. Hurry, or you'll be late for school again. Not me, cried Willis. I won't be late. I'm the fastest man on earth. He closed his eyes and imagined himself winning a race in a great stadium while thousands cheered. He tore off his pajamas and threw them on the bed. He ran into the bedroom, brushed his teeth, washed his face, combed his hair, jumped into his clothing, and ran downstairs into the kitchen. I don't want any breakfast now, said Willis. I'll eat on board ship. On board what ship? asked his mother. On board the spaceship, of course, said Willis, gulping his orange juice. Here, eat your cereal, said his mother, handing him a bowl. I'd like to know where you get all those strange ideas. Hurry up now. Willis finished his cereal. He grabbed his books and dashed out the door. He raced down the street. At the corner, he stopped and waited for the traffic light to turn green. Then he crossed the street. He walked along slowly. He glanced up at the bright white clouds that hung in the sky. He walked still slower. He stepped carefully. He made sure not to step on the cracks in the sidewalk. Watch your step, he said to himself, holding his breath. Oh, oh, careful. One false move and you're done for. Steady, Willis, steady, said Willis. Careful. Steady as she goes. Watch out. Don't fall into that crevasse. Willis walked on down the street. He passed Mrs. Sorley's front yard. The lawn was overgrown, and the rose bushes tangled together in a rumpled clump. A rose popped out here and there. A tall flower towered over Willis' head. Willis suddenly stopped still. He didn't move a muscle. This is what I was afraid of, muttered Willis. I'd better get it before it gets me. Stand back, he whispered. Don't move. Don't budge. That's a man-eating jungle wum wum, and they is fatal to the touch. I'm going to cut it to pieces. Willis walked backwards down the street, his books balanced on his head. Good morning, Willis, called the policeman on the corner, and he waved. Carry on, cried Willis in reply, returning the salute. The parade can now begin. Uh, beg pardon, said the policeman, looking puzzled. You'd better hurry or you'll be late for school. Willis stood at attention, stiff as a board. You may now let the troops pass in review shouted Willis. Sound the bugles! Make sure all the guns are polished, and see that the cavalry stays in step. Forward! March! A piece of sewer pipe was lying on the ground, and a workman was digging a trench in which it was to go. Willis climbed up on the pipe. He walked along it, one foot gently placed before the other, his hands outspread. Ladies and gentlemen, cried Willis, I now present the feature attraction, the star of the show. 
the one and only Willis Partridge, the world-famous tightrope artist who has performed before the kings and queens and princes of Europe and China. He will now do his death-defying walk across the tightrope and without a net. Steady, Willis, said Willis. You can do it. A man in a dark hat passed Willis. As he passed, he stopped and took a match out of his pocket and lit his pipe. Willis quickly ducked into a doorway. He stooped down low and peered out at the man. Just what I feared, said Willis breathlessly. They're after me. It's the counter-spies, said Willis, turning up the collar on his jacket. They're finally on my trail. Good thing I'm disguised as a little boy going to school. But I'd better burn the secret papers anyway, and I'd better change my disguise. I think I'll put on the false whiskers and dark glasses. Then they'll never get me, not Willis Partridge, Master Spy. A woman in an apron leaned out of a window and shook out a feather duster. A cloud of dust flew out and one of the feathers came loose and floated in the air. It spun around and around and landed at Willis' feet. Willis looked over his shoulder. Then he bent down and picked up the feather. He peered at it closely. Just as I thought, he muttered, from an Indian headdress. Navajo by the looks of it. An ambush, cried Willis. Watch out. Here they come again. They're all around. Thousands of them. But they won't get me. Not Willis Partridge, Indian hunter and crack shot. Willis galloped down the street. Clip, clop, clippity, clop. Willis skidded to a stop. A kitten peered out from behind a picket fence. It looked up at Willis and meowed. Run, cried Willis. Run for your lives. Everybody out of the way. I'll take care of this myself. All right now, muttered Willis. Give me room. Everybody stand back. I'm going after that lion, and I'm not coming back without it. It's not for nothing they call me Willis, the lion killer. Willis crossed the street and started up the steps of the school. He pushed open the big doors and walked down the corridor towards his classroom. He could hear the school orchestra tuning up in the assembly hall. He stopped and listened for a moment. Then he took a pencil out of his pocket and waved it in the air about his head. All right now, gentlemen, he said in a firm voice. All together and I want the drums to play very loud. One, two, three. Willis opened the door of his classroom and walked in. The teacher and all the children were in the middle of an arithmetic lesson. Willis, said the teacher, you're late again. Yes, ma'am, said Willis, but I couldn't help it. You see, I was hunting zebras in the park, and a great big... Well, all right, Willis, interrupted the teacher. You can tell us about it later. Let's do some arithmetic now. We're working on long division. Yes, ma'am, sighed Willis. He took his seat, picked up a pencil, and began to do long division. Maybe someday, he thought hopefully, I'll invent an automatic arithmetic machine, and I think I'll make it do long division, too.